Welcome to the November 20th meeting, uh, regular meeting of the Board of Education. I'm Kate Borninski, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. We have a, a bit of a um, very energetic crowd, it sounds like. <laughs> um, I would like to welcome my fellow board members and ask them to introduce themselves, starting on my left. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I'm Kim Crouch. Uh, Patricia Mullen, welcome. Uh, Patty McLean, thank you for being here tonight. Good evening. I'm Anupam Chugsidu. Thanks for being here. Good evening. I'm Doug Brooks. Thanks for being here. Okay, Ms. Merritt, would you like to introduce your staff? Yes. Good evening and welcome. It's always a great evening when we have so many students in the room. That's a reminder why we are all here and the work that we're doing. So welcome to everyone, but especially our young people here this evening. I'd like to have my staff begin by introducing themselves to you after I introduce Miss Liz Adams, <laughs> my assistant. And we thank you, Liz, for the work you do to take the minutes. And also Charlie Jones, the man behind the scenes who makes sure that he captures these meetings for us on video for those that cannot be here in the community. Now, uh, beginning with the rest of the staff. Good evening, Nick Brandon, ex Executive Director of Communications and Marketing. Special shout out to the state champs in the house. In the back. Hi, I'm Debbie Piaz. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer. Welcome. Good evening, Liz Vartanian Gibbs, Assistant Superintendent Human Resources, and welcome to the students from the Goals Program. Good evening, Kurt Tiskutz, Executive Director of Student Services. Welcome. Well, I'm Mike Bender, Chief Academic Officer. Would everyone please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. It's adoption of the agenda and approval of the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion on action item 18-1137. Uh, Madam President, I move that we adopt the adoption of the agenda, approval of consent agenda, action item 18-1137. Second. The motion was made by Member Brooks and seconded by Member. Or motion was made by Member Mullen and seconded by Be Member Brooks. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, Ms. Merritt, do you want to take us through the consent agenda? Yes. Thank you, President Borninski. This evening, the consent agenda consists of human resources transactions. Since our last time together, we continue to hire champions for our students here in the district. We have you uh, or ask you to consider an administrative replacement for the student support coordinator at Holsing Elementary School this evening. We have leaves of absence, the approval of the minutes from the regular meeting on November the 13th, 2018, and we have the first reading of two policies. The first is 7440.1, that's on video surveillance, and the second is 7540.2, that's technology privacy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Say aye. <laughs> Please say aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, the motion passes 6 0. Next up is everybody's favorite part celebrating success. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Liz. I'm too That's okay. I like to so good that. evening, everyone. <laughs> I am going to introduce you to two brand new teachers that together bring 34 years of teaching experience to us this evening. First, we have Rob Basola. Come on up, Rob, all the way. Right there. You got it. So Rob comes to us with a bachelor's degree from Eastern Michigan University, as well as a master's degree from Eastern Michigan University. He has over 20 years of experience, and he is our new life management teacher at East Middle School. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. And I was a Huron and an Eagle at Eastern, which is weird. They changed their mascot on me. Very nice. Okay. Yes. Are the colors the same, school colors? Yes. Okay, great. I do believe. Okay, good. Next we have Kamar. Iram, come on up. She comes to us 
us with a bachelor's degree from the University of Windsor, as well as 14 years of experience, and she is our new English language learners teacher at East Middle School. Welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. My name is Iram Kamar, and um, just wanted to say I'm very pleased to be here. Um, my children are the product of Plymouth Canton Community Schools, and I strongly believe that part of their success is due to the hardworking teachers that taught them at this district. I always wanted to work at Plymouth Canton Community Schools. I'm very excited to be here and be part of the team, and I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Welcome. We'd like to welcome you by coming around to shake the members of the Board of Education. Hands. Welcome aboard. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Next, I would like to introduce Joseph Blueblatz. Joe, come on up. Thank you. So this evening, I would like to introduce our new student support coordinator at Halsing Elementary School. He comes to us from Eastern Michigan University with a bachelor's degree in history. He also has a teaching certificate in social studies and political science, as well as a master's of art in educational leadership from Wayne State University. He is currently, for a couple more days, a teacher at Livonia Public Schools. And when I called Livonia Public Schools to um, request some references regarding Joe. They only had the highest remarks regarding him, his ethics, his support of students, his relationship with students, and his leadership. So welcome. We are proud to have you here on our team. Thank you, Dr. Fartini Gibbs. Uh, thank you to the Board of Education. Greatly appreciate this moment. Uh, thank you to Superintendent Merritt and her core team as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to assisting Principal Chambers at Hulsing Elementary. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to assist our teachers and students in the growth and learning, and I look forward to serving Plymouth Canton Community Schools and the community at large. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Welcome. Welcome aboard, Joe. Okay, I have to say it. We are so lucky to have Joe. <laughs> he was my son's swim coach for several years, and he is a true champion. So yay, right. yay. Thank you for that feedback. Okay, I think I know where we're at the, on the agenda now. <laughs> Sorry to everyone that I was trying to jump ahead, but that was really important um, to welcome everyone. So now, I think we're at letter B, which is celebrating success. Um, tonight, the presenter is member Mullen, and she is presenting an award to the Plymouth Boys Cross Country State Champions. Okay, come on down. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna fill in back here. And which one of you is Carter? You made it. Okay, I'll tell you when you're speaking. Great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, this is the best part. Celebrating success tonight will honor the Plymouth High School Boys Cross Country Team for the amazing accomplishment of winning the MHSAA State Championship earlier this month. The team competed against the top state schools at Michigan International Speedway to finish with a team score of 122, just five points ahead of Wald Lake Central. Junior Carter Solomon finished as runner-up, and sophomore Patrick Burns placed 15th. Tonight we are joined by Carter and Patrick along with their fellow state teammates Brandon Boyd, Jarrett Warner, Tyler Musson, Basil Syed, Connor Davis, and coach John Mickus. This is the third overall state title in Plymouth High School history, and the team will be honored forever with a banner and trophy in the Plymouth gym. They're already here, and Coach Mikas, please come say a few words for the team. 
Uh, thanks for having us out. Uh, it was great for us to be able to bring the first ever boys state championship to Plymouth High School and the first ever cross country state championship ever to PCEP. So we're uh, awesome for all the support that we have from our athletic department and everybody here. And um, great job with the team and happy to have been a former runner here in PCEP and then be able to come back and coach. It's uh, amazing to uh, be able to bring it here and we're happy to, um, to be here and thanks for having us. He wasn't here when the boys decided that he would be speaking. So, Carter, come on up. Carter, where are you? Over here. Come on up and do the speaking. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Carter. And uh, being a part of this team is something that I'll never forget. Um, going into the season, I knew we had a chance to take home the state title. Uh, I knew it was going to take a lot of hard work and consistency. And I think Coach Mick is one of the best coaches at PSEP, I believe. Uh, he trained us well, and we were right where we need to be. And we executed the statement, and it's something I'll never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to present each student athlete with the Students with Tenacity Achieving. Is that my phone? Yeah. <laughs> It's your background music. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna just press on. So, on behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to present each student with the Students with Tenacity Achieving and Reaching Success Awards for your dedication and achievement. Uh, Carter Solomon, Patrick Burns, Brandon Boyd. Uh, Jarrett Warner, Tyler Musson, right behind me, Basil Saeed, and Connor Davis. Fantastic. And also on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to present John Mikas, Coach John Mikas, with the Mary Beth Carroll Extra Miler Award. State champs, please go up and shake the board members and administrators' hands. Congratulations. 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 Awesome. Great job. Congratulations. 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 Great job. Great job. Congratulations. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great While they're uh, trying to get out into the hallway, I think we'll go ahead with our board committee reports. Um, first up is the president's report. Uh, member Sidhu and I attended the Wayne County Association of School Boards meeting last um, Thursday at Wayne Risa. And it was a really wonderful program. Um, there were two excellent presentations. One was on um, the Ready to Launch Career Counselor Program and the Workforce Development, Development Initiative. Um, and I'll just mention that member CDU's team helped make the website for the Workforce Development Initiative. Um, and it's pretty cool. So I'm hoping that our students will benefit from that. And then we also um, had a presentation on uh, Alice training, which was really um, interesting and informative. So, um, next, we have the Student Performance and Achievement Committee with Member Sidhu. Thank you. Uh, we provided an update at the last meeting uh, from our last meeting, and we have not met since, but I would encourage you to attend our next meeting on December 5th at 4.30 p.m. right here in this room, and I would love to have more participation there, <coughs> so thank you. 
Okay, and next is Policy Committee Member Crouch. Okay. Well, thank you. We um, had our uh, policy meeting today just a few minutes ago. We got out. Uh, it continues to be um, just a great uh, uh, com uh, committee to be on. We had a really great um, candid, substantive conversation um, related to uh, our hiring practices. One of the things that we've talked about is that we spent the last year looking at our equity policy and bringing in the various departments in the school district to show our, to talk about how they're um, implementing that equity policy. And so today we uh, continued those discussions with our um, human resources group and it was a great substantive discussion and I really appreciate them for um, taking the time to go through that. Uh, the other thing we talked about is um, developing some criteria as it relates to naming our uh, uh, school buildings or renaming them. So one of the things we talked about at the board meetings a few um, weeks ago was a proposal to change one of the names of the, the school districts. And so, I mean, the school district, one of the uh, uh, elementary schools. And so one of the things we've been looking at is what is our policy or process to do that and so we kind of had some discussion on that today to talk about uh, what could be some potential criteria for that so um, really good discussion today our next meeting will be December 11th at 530 here at the board office you're all free uh, to come they are great meetings uh, where we talk about a lot of substantive stuff thank you um, next is finance and operations and member Kehoe's not here um, can I just go back really oh, quick? Sure. Okay. I would also uh, just like, I don't want to be remiss, we actually had selection for our community member, um, Chris Allen, who's here, and so I would like to welcome him. Just ask him to stand up real quick, do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> to, to join our um, committee. So thank you for going through the uh, selection process. Okay. Um, so now we're at finance and operations, and Member Kehoe's not here. Um, Member Brooks, I know you were at the meeting. Could you give a report? Sure. Sure. Well, at the, um, the meeting, we talked uh, and discussed things about the uh, financial audits, and uh, um, and also we talked about uh, um, in, um, in the, um, operations about the uh, the goals facility um, that were. Uh, um, discussing uh, the uh, um, expansion for uh, more students. And another thing we talked about was the iPad purchase for elementary buildings. And um, the, oh, we also had one of our new citizen candidates that was in it, Mr. Roderick. He was with, it, with us um, um, bright-eyed, <laughs> wide-eyed about What's going on? Of course, he's uh, um, in finance, so some, a lot of things weren't, you know, that that uh, new to him. But uh, it was great f learning for myself also because um, I'm finally getting what, uh, um, what what's done in the finance. And um, the hardest part is knowing um, where the money comes from and and how we're supposed to spend it wisely. So and present it to um, all the, the people. So that's about it. Okay, thank you. Um, next is citizens' comments. And I have two cards. To, if anybody else wishes to speak, please um, fill out a card and you can give it to Mr. Brandon. Just as a reminder, everyone gets three minutes to speak and Mr. Brandon will be timing you. Um, first is Mark Slavens, or should I say Judge? Mark just okay. just Mark Slavens tonight. Okay. <laughs> well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the president and also the superintendent and all the other board members for allowing me to speak tonight. I'd like to begin with some words and tell you what a good job I think you're all doing. And. Uh, all I hear is positive things about the district, and I think that you're all doing a great job. And one of the signs to me that everything is going well here is I don't read a whole lot about you in the paper. So I think that's <laughs> always a positive sign was my experience. So, and I'd like to tell the superintendent, I look around this table, and I see some great educators that you have here. So congratulations on the staff that you have. Thank and you. thank you all for what you've done 
for my children, my children are doing great out in the community and I believe it's because of the teachers here in this uh, school district. So thank you all very much. One of the things that I always dreaded as a school board member is to hear some old school board member come and drone on. So I'm going to try not to drone on, all right? Um, why I'm here is I went to a presentation about a month ago uh, called Not in Our Town. And I heard three young people from the park speak that night, and it really touched my heart. And I just am coming uh, to kind of, I had promised them that I would speak to you. And their names are Antonio Scherzansky, Marquette Winston, and Isabel Fessler. And if I mutilated any of their names, I apologize. That was not my intention. And what they talked about is bullying. And that's not something that's unique to this district. It's something that back when I was going to school with Fred Flintstone that we had <laughs> bullying back then, okay? So it's not anything that this district's unique about. But I think it's always important for those that are in, in power to look at how we can help our children with regard to anti-bullying. And they had three suggestions, and I just, I promised them that I would pass those on to you, and you can take these recommendations, and I know you're going to be setting some goals, and maybe if you could look at uh, making anti-bullying one of your goals, and maybe it already is. But the first is that they felt that uh, teachers needed more training with regard to uh, how to deal with anti-bullying. And I, I, uh, secondly, they indicated that they felt that all that was talked about in their classes with regard to bullying is maybe about one hour a year. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, and you certainly are the educators and know that, but if that is all the amount of time, I would certainly recommend more time with regard to that. And finally, they recommended that you begin all these programs in the lower grades. And I think those are all excellent recommendations, and this is not in any attempt to criticize anybody at this table, but it is just an attempt to maybe ask you to focus on um, anti-bullying. And finally, as a proud parent of, uh, three, of two children that graduated from Plymouth High School and ran cross-country, I'd like to congratulate the cross-country team. I think it was wonderful that they did that. And John, uh, who I knew as the assistant coach, so it shows how far back I go, uh, uh, indicated to me that they had knocked my son off the board as far as being on the board as uh, far as. Um, so congratulations to all of them. And again, thank you all very, very much. And keep doing the great job because you really are doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. And next is Dalton Barthold. Hello. Um, uh, thank you to those of you that were able to come and attend Into the Woods again. I know I talked about this last week, but it really does mean a lot to all of us there. And um, to show our thanks, I was able to organize a present for the school board members wow. and members of the, uh, the superintendent's cabinet. So if you guys would accept my gift, um, it is signed by the cast and crew of Into the Woods, and it says, thank you for supporting the arts from the Park Players Theater Company. So, nice. one of you would like to thank you. <laughs> um, it's just one of our ways of saying thank you. Um, we feel as though we've been recognized by you guys, and that means a great deal to us. Um, and I feel like we're making really good progress. Um, so again, I really hope you guys who were able to see it enjoyed the show. I know that we worked very hard on it. And um, again, thank you. There was uh, obviously a few problems which is what I'm here to talk about again, uh, besides just saying thank you, is that uh, we as a company have just the stage to work with because we don't have any sort of backstage or anything, which is very um, even atypical for high schools. And um, this is just like a side note, but in, in the guy's locker room, there's no soap dispenser. I know that that's not you guys, but 
th that was pretty alarming that there was no soap dispenser. But uh, that's like one of the examples of like the ways that things are not being held equitably, in my opinion. I could be totally wrong. Um, and so in June, as you guys know, I work very closely with Mr. Bird. Um, he proposed a solution to this, which is... This was never presented, um, but was very much talked about. Uh, it was shut down by one or more people. Um, and it is an expansion of the Logan Auditorium in a model rama And it, this includes a backstage area and room for growth for the community. So if you'd like me to leave it here for you guys to look at, it's very well made, not by me. But um, if you're interested, I can talk more about it for a very long time but this is just what I have to offer for you guys. So it's not just my words going out into the air. Um, I really hope you guys might have an opportunity to just glance at this and I can talk to you more about what it is. It's an expansion of the Logan. Um, that's about as far as I can say. Um, and as a theater company, we would really use it um, for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we are at letter E, administrative reports and recommendations. First is the superintendent's report. Thank you. I think I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that we are about to enter into Thanksgiving for our break and um, just take this opportunity to just tell our entire staff and school community how thankful we are for each and everything you do every day to elevate our students, our selfless teachers who just continue to encourage our students to take risks and the products that you see here today um, that's really a result of the support that they have in the classrooms uh, we think about our administrators our incredible support staff think about our parents for really entrusting us with the lives of their young people um, we just have a, a very strong committed community and this is the time to sit back and really say how thankful we are because we really are providing incredible opportunities for our young people and it is not there's no ceiling I'll say that in Plymouth Canton there's nothing that our young people can't do as evidenced by state championships I need to give a shout out this evening to the marching band and really their success um, I'm gonna read some of this because I don't want to mess it up but the PCMP marching band um, they had an amazing showing at nationals last weekend in Indianapolis their 2018 program is called textured and it earned them advanced it advanced them to the national semifinal round being only one of two schools from Michigan to do so um, in the semifinals round the band achieved a score of 83.600 that placed them number 14th in the class of 20th overall in the country. So really congratulations to our band, to their incredible director, Dr. Thoman, um, is in, in once again his incredible students for earning this accomplishment. We saw our cross country um, young men this evening and their success. And success is just duplicated throughout extracurricular activities, throughout the classroom. We're gonna meet some amazing young people from our goals program this evening. And we really just are thankful for that opportunity. So I just had to share that today. So I'm gonna stop talking so we can meet and talk a little bit more to our young uh, people here in this school district. So thank you. Um, and next we're at uh, finance and operations under administrative reports. Um, and we're going to be looking at a first reading on the goals program expansion product. Ms. Piaz, can you give us a little description? Sure. Um, at the uh, finance and operations meeting last week, we um, teed this off and then we'll uh, go over it again this evening, but uh, we have an opportunity to um, support the um, Plymouth Canton uh, Community Schools goals program. It's for resident student ages 18 to 26. Um, these are students who are on a certificate of completion path in our high school and we're more part of the categorical programs to move them on to this program. This program is located um, at 6215 uh, Canton Center Road and we have suite 301 currently which is approximately 2,500 square feet and we have the opportunity to rent an additional 2,900 square feet in the adjacent um, suite N303. So we've negotiated um, a tentative lease agreement with the 
associate with the neighbors, um, given your uh, approval this evening. Um, part of this um, issue is going to be um, discussed with some of the teachers and some of the students in the goals program, and they're here this evening to, to talk to a little bit more about what the goals program is. And so I'll turn it back over to um, Superintendent Merritt to do so. All right, so a couple of months ago in our workshop, we had the opportunity to talk uh, then about a proposal to move our goals program to our Tanger building, which um, is a building that is not currently being used. Uh, we looked at some uh, numbers for expansion of that building, and at that time, the numbers, um, we decided as a, a board community, let's table that to our facilities and utilization study to make sure that we're taking a look at all of our facilities and to best um, meet our needs. At the same time, we have our goals program that was um, currently in need of additional space. And so our amazing administrators and teachers came together to creatively say, how can we meet the needs, the, the space needs of our program and our students at this time and really uh, further enhance the program without moving to the Tanger Center. And so a proposal that um, we, we talked about is something that Ms. Piaz has shared with you is expanding our current location, which is right there on Canton Center, to take on some additional space that will allow for um, expansion of some of the goals within the program. And so this evening, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Jocelyn Clark first to uh, the podium to just address a little bit about our program. Um, and I think she'll be joined today by two of our great teachers in the program, Jason Tyler, as well as Julie Kazin, mm -hmm. and some of our amazing young people that are part of our program. All right, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, you know, Goals has been around for um, a number of years now, but we're kind of a little place, and so not a lot of people know about us. Um, but the community is becoming more and more aware of us. Um, our students are working in the community. Our students, we have, right now we have 11 students, or excuse me, we have 22 students that are, that are with us. 11 of them are competitively employed outside the school day. Um, and that is a really great statistic um, just kind of when we look at nationwide um, employment for students in our group. That's a really great statistic. And it really shows um, our teachers and our staff and their connections in the community and the support they provide for students. Um, so we are very proud of that. And we're very proud of students. Our students and our, our students we have here with us today, they'll tell you they've been at these jobs for years. And that's one of the things that they learn at the Goals Program is stability, resiliency. So we're very proud of our program. Um, the expansion would allow us to really look at providing a greater variety of opportunities for students. Um, we're in right, right now, I don't know if, you've, if any of you have ever been with us, but we are one room and we have staff and students and we have some of us that office there and we're, we're one little space and we make it work, but um, with the expansion, it would allow us to create some partnerships with some community businesses. We've had some of our um, local, l local businesses that work on Etsy, for example, that want us to work on their production. Well, we can't do it because we don't have space to store their materials. And so they, ha they would have to come up at the end of the day and pick it up and it just doesn't work. Um, we have a couple students that have expressed an interest in starting their own business. And that is just an amazing task, but it requires a lot of coaching. And so right now, being all in one room, it's tough for us to find places to do that. It's tough for us to find a place where maybe a student and a mentor could work together on a business plan, you know? So the expansion would allow us to do, um, to offer those opportunities to students. Um, another thing that it would allow us to do, you know, our students are, between the, 18, between the ages of 18 and 26. And when you think about where other students are when they're between 18 and 26, they're in a variety of environments throughout the day. So if they're at Schoolcraft or they're at Madonna, um, there's, a, there's a, a lounge area and there's a, a computer area and there's just different spaces to go. And so that's the other piece that the expansion would allow us is to give our students um, an, an, an opportunity similar to their peers. You know, now granted, we're in a much smaller place than Schoolcraft or, or Madonna, but um, it allows us to help, help students learn what to do in those different spaces. Because, you know, sometimes it takes a little courage to try something new, but if we could kind of try it out 
and learn some of the skills when we're together in a, in a nice safe place, then when they get out to Starbucks or when they go to um, a class at Madonna, because they have some, some uh, community ed things there, um, they're braver, you know, and they know what to do and they know how to, how to be in those different sort of spaces. So um, we are very excited about the opportunity for an expansion and we really think that it would help us to, again, offer students more opportunities on an individual basis, but also, also more opportunities as a group. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to our teachers now. Good evening. I'm uh, Jason Toller. Uh, this is my partner, Julie Kazen. We uh, started the program, uh, and we've been there since the beginning. We actually started off in old Starkweather, if you guys remember that. And when they kicked everybody out, they put us in. So that's where we started off at. So we've been there around a long time. We love the location. And I want to introduce uh, Julie Trabowski. Thank you. Avery Byam and Garrick McDaniel, and Mitchell Sexton. Uh, Avery, Julie, and Garrick were from our first class in 2012 to 2013. They all gained employment during that time, and they are still and at- They began 14 for me. Oh, 14, sorry, 14. That's okay, 12 all, was- All still there at, at their job. So Avery works at uh, Jimmy John's, Julie works at Myers, and Garrick works Meyer, at yeah. a catering company. Um, and actually, last year, Avery was actually uh, honored by the state legislator uh, for Take Your Legislator to Work Day from the state of Michigan as well. <laughs> she was one of 10 students in the whole state. Right. Uh, in the last two years, Gold students have been selected twice to represent mm -hmm. the whole state for uh, adults with disabilities and in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So that's a good re uh, right there on its own. On its own. Uh, but we thought we didn't just want to say a couple things about what they got from the program. It would be great. Yes. Hi, my name is Julie Trubowski. And... I work at the Candemaya, and what I do there is cleaning and mostly cards, but I did do greening before. And and what I have learned was is how to um, get involved of everything around, like like a job place or learning how to do things. Right, and the big thing we push is the employment side of it is obviously when you get employment, get you a paycheck. Then we right. can work on the living. Then we can work on the other things in our day for hobbies. Exactly. Julie now actually volunteers as well for reading in a program in elementary school as well. Mm -hmm. On oh, top yeah. of driving and with her own license. So right. Julie, Julie, My parents told you then. Yeah, they, they yeah. told <laughs> you. So, Avery, you want to say anything? Or Gary, you want to go first? My name is Garrick. Um, I've been with the program since 2012, 2013, and I left around 20, I want to say about 2016, 2017, maybe. So I've been there for a while. I work at Marquis Catering on John Hanks and Cherry Hill. It's like right next to 7-Eleven, and it's across from uh, Family Videos. I've been there for a long time. I love the people there. What I learned from the program is how to communicate with other people get to know them and see what they do and see what the other kids like. Some kids don't know how to do things, so you want to show them and um, make sure they understand how to, you know, communicate with each other about showing them how to get a job and showing them what to do and what not to do, right from wrong and things like that, basically. And then if, I'm sure if you've ever been to Jimmy John's and can't say, you know Avery, <laughs> she, can up, she can up sell anything. I always say she could sell ice to an Eskimo. Uh, if you've been there, you, I guarantee you know her. Hi, my name is Avery Barham. I have been working at Jimmy John's for almost seven years now. As Jason mentioned earlier, I had a state legislator and someone from the House of Representatives come and watch what I do at work. I am a cashier slash cleaning crew. At Jimmy John's, I take people's orders as well as clean tables or mop floors, sweep floors, stuff like that. What I have learned from the program is to be self-sufficient and independent and how to live on my own. Um, and all these great jobs we couldn't have with, without, as I'm sure you know, a real estate agent says, location, location, location. Our location is amazing. 
Uh, we are very blessed to be in Canton with every business you can ever imagine in the community. Uh, we, we are at Canton Center in, near Ford Road. It's amazing. Without our, our neighbors and communities, we, we've built relationships with all our, our neighbors. And we wouldn't be there and having these kids have those jobs without that. So this would be a huge, huge win for us uh, to expand. As you can tell, luckily me and Julie get along really well because now it'd be two teachers, one classroom, <laughs> always bumping heads. But luckily we get along very well on that. And I promised Mitchell I wouldn't put him on the spot, so I'm not going no, to. That's all right. But he's here in support and he's one of our great students as well. And Mitchell, you did, you did an excellent job at the Thanksgiving feast. That was amazing. <laughs> I love that hat. Yeah. <laughs> So if you have any questions for him, they'll, they'll, they'll answer as well. Okay. Questions? No question, but a comment. Okay. So thank you for sharing your stories and the program. What I'm seeing is not only are you teaching them life skills, but leadership skills. I am so impressed to see the leadership skills that all of you are exhibiting. So thank you for being such amazing leaders and uh, actually just having us look up to you. So thank you. And we would love to just invite you all yeah. to shake our hands. We're so yeah. proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet 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 you. And if you notice their gorgeous shirts as they walked That's around, right. yeah. those shirts were donated by Moving the Mitten, a real estate company, which also helps our partnerships of knowing when new businesses are coming in and stuff as well. Um, we, it, it's been a great, actually, one of the best things we got today was our, our cookie basket, right? Our, oh, our, yeah. Right, Mitchell, our cookie basket? Uh, we were at Cedar Brook Living Center, and they actually bought cookies for everyone from the Cookies by Design. So That's awesome. really good to see the community always returning to us as well. That's good. So uh, just to uh, kind of revisit again, uh, when we first looked at the expansion of the program, we were looking at the possibility of moving this to Tanger. We brought you a price tag of approximately $1.7 million for this program, as well as another uh, of our adult ASD program and our professional learning center to go there. Um, when I say the creativity of our staff to come back and say, hey, we really need this. We need to ad ad uh, invest in our students in this space. And waiting is problematic because that was going to take us a few years to get through the facilities and utilization study. So I just really applaud that effort. Um, and this, what you're looking at tonight as a first uh, read and something that we would ask you to consider on your next uh, board meeting. Through FNO, they've had us come back and forth a couple of times and said, really present to us a business plan, a full business plan, all in, looking at additional costs for renting, looking at the leaseholder agreements that you can make. So they're actually expanding that uh, space, getting some furniture in the in the uh, in the um, the new spaces, the new areas, some things that are like loungewear, or uh, well, not loungewear. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of furniture that will meet all the needs of the programs. And so I really, once again, just applaud them for the creativity. And um, you have a full business plan before you, now bringing that overall cost to approximately $102,000 for the expansion. And so we will then come back if there are any further questions to ask for your consideration and a vote at the next meeting so we can get about the business of expansion so our young people continue with, can continue with the um, elevation every single day. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, then we will move on and look at consider approval of resolution to purchase additional sixth generation iPads for elementary schools. This uh, is actually. I think we missed one. Pardon me? Discovery Roof. That's day. after this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so we're going ahead with six, uh, going ahead on considering the sixth generation iPads for elementary schools um, action item 181138. It's a final reading. I'm looking for a motion on this, please. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to consider approval of resolution to purchase additional sixth 
generation iPads for elementary schools. Final reading, action item 1811-38. Aye, second. Okay. Motion was made by, made by Member Brooks and seconded by Member Sidhu. Okay, is there discussion on this? Um, I believe that we did look at this last week. So, um, if nobody has any questions, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 6 0. Okay, now <laughs> we are looking at action item 181139 consider approval of the Discovery Middle School roof project. This is a first and final reading. Um, so I'm looking for a motion on this, please. Madam President, I move that we consider the approval of the Discovery Middle School Roof Project first and final reading, action item number 18-11-39. Second. Okay. The motion made, was made by Member Sidhu and seconded by Member Brooks. So, is there discussion on this? Questions? Yes, Member Sidhu. I have a question. Uh, when I was looking through the documentation, so this is fixing the problems that we tried to fix before? So we had a patch that we did earlier in April of 2018 to see if it would cure the situation, and it was approximately $2,500 to $3,000. We did that work, but it's still reoccurring. So now the um, uh, roofing consultant has suggested to a full replace of that roof. It's just a small section, section number tw uh, three, I believe, and it was already on your uh, list of bond projects. It's just pulling it ahead um, because of the urgency of the matter. Okay. Thank you. So this section is um, over the gym, is that correct? Correct. Is the gym floor wooden? Yes. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Okay, now we are at Teaching and Learning with Dr. Bender. Thank you, President Borninski. On October 23rd, members of the Teaching and Learning team provide, presented an overview of the work we are engaged in to support the dynamic plan. Last week, we provided the state assessment results, which included English language arts and social studies. This evening, we are glad to have the opportunity to provide the foundation for curriculum development and to go into even greater detail about the actions we are engaged in to support student learning in social studies and English language arts. Here to get us started is Dr. Deirdre Brady, Director of Curriculum and Professional Development. Good evening. Nice to be here again to see everyone. We, we've had a lot of exciting things happening tonight, and teaching and learning is exciting, too. We have uh, fun things we're going to share this evening with you. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here because, obviously, the, the core of what we do is the teaching um, of students and for their success. Um, one of the things that we're, two of the things we're here to share tonight are, is our work surrounding social studies <clears throat> and English language arts. Um, as a team, as the, the curriculum and instruction team, our job every day is to make sure that we are um, hitting that second sub-goal from the dynamic plan. We follow that closely. The second sub-goal is developing high-quality curriculum instruction and assessment, and that's the work that my team does on a daily basis. Our job is to ensure that we have all the pieces that we need in place for our teachers, for our students, to make sure we're elevating every student every day. A couple weeks ago, um, a few board meetings passed, I came to you and shared a five-year um, cycle for curriculum. It is something that is part of this um, dynamic plan that we focus on every day. And I want to go a little more in-depth with that for you this evening to really highlight where we are with the social studies and the ELA, which is what we're sharing tonight. So you'll notice in phase one, which is the reviewing and planning phase, that we have one content that is sitting in that phase for the 18-19 school year, and that is the six through 12 social studies. So in this phase, it really is looking to see what do we have in place, what do we need to do differently, look at the state standards, look at our current processes, look at our current curriculum, and make 
a plan if we need to to do any changes. So this year, that is the work that is happening with 6 through 12 social studies, which Rania um, Hamoud will be talking about in more depth in just a moment. In phase two this year, you'll see that we have three different content sitting there. Our K-5 writing, our 6 through 10 ELA, as well as our 11 and 12 ELA. The 11 and 12 is broken out separately because it needs a little bit of different work. But all three of those are in the revising and developing stage, which means we've made a decision on some things we need to do, and we are now working on that. So it involves piloting, that could be piloting lessons, it could be piloting resources, it's looking at different technology pieces, and it's the really, um, focused work and it's heavy work because a lot of development goes into this phase. The final thing that we have going on this year is the K-5 reading. That's in phase three, which is the implementing phase. So in this phase, our K-5 through reading, all the teachers are now using the new curriculum that has been developed. So that's all teachers. And a lot of support goes into this area, which Carrie will be talking about in a moment of, of how we support teachers um, as they're in this. You'll notice that this document, I went through it very quickly before. Um, each of the different contents has a different color. So you'll see, look at phase two. There are three of them that are sitting in red. Red is the ELA. So as you look at the document across time, you'll notice that the ELA moves as time goes on. Um, the yellow is the social studies, and those are the ones that we're focusing on tonight. So again, phases, phase one, we have six through 12 social studies. Phase two, the ELA, um, and the writing at the elementary level. And then in phase three, we have the K-5 reading. <clears throat> in order to give you more specifics, we have two of our, our curriculum coordinators here this evening, Rania Hamoud and Carrie Fromm. I'm gonna invite Rania up first to share the work that we're doing surrounding social studies. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to share all of the wonderful work that's going to be planned um, in regards to ELA as well as social studies. Um, we are here to elevate every student every day um, in our district and that is a goal of ours and we're gonna make it happen. Uh, before I talk about uh, social studies, um, I did want to share some information with the board, uh, just giving you a brief overview uh, about the Michigan Social Studies Standards um, as these are currently being updated and will likely be adopted next summer. Uh, this will also help the board understand the why and regarding our action plan for social studies. Uh, the next several slides that you're going to see um, include information, it, this is actually from the Michigan Department of Education. Uh, the last standards update, as you can see here in the upper left, was back in 2007. Uh, since then, there was feedback from teachers and social studies organizations to have fewer, clearer, and more rigor in the standards. Uh, there was also a request to have more integration of the content and to have the standards uh, reflect deeper student learning while also increasing student outcomes um, in social studies. Uh, the reasoning behind this is um, when the C3 framework was actually introduced. <coughs> in 2014, the work began in updating the social studies standards. Uh, there was an update committee that provided its first draft for a review committee to actually provide feedback. Um, and then from 2015 to 2016, there was an external committee that also provided feedback. Uh, and there was some public feedback that was collected as well. In 2017, the social studies writers incorporated the suggestions from the committees and developed several drafts. Uh, when I say several drafts, it was a very long process um, going back and forth to update those uh, standards. Focus groups were also created, um, and this focus group met for six full days, re reviewing draft number eight. So when I said going back and forth, you could see that it was definitely um, a lengthy process. Uh, then in 2018, the social studies writers incorporated the focus group suggestions um, and presented the state standards to the State Board of Education. Uh, the State Board of Education wanted to get some public feedback. They weren't just pleased with the standards. They wanted to make sure that uh, the general public also had a say in the standards. So this obviously made the timeline a little bit longer. Uh, several months later, public, uh, public policy associates were hired to conduct uh, what's called listen and learn sessions. Um, these were all over the state. There were 18 of these sessions. Uh, and then the state also added an online public survey for those uh, Michigan residents who couldn't attend any of the listen and learn sessions. Uh, our district here had a group of middle and high school teachers that worked together uh, with Carrie Fromm over the summer and they actually reviewed the updated standards, compared them to uh, the old standards, uh, and then took the time to actually take that public survey um, as a team, but they each individually contributed to that survey. 
Uh, as part of the last step uh, in the process, the Michigan Department of Education created what's called a task force, and this was uh, created to incorporate more feedback. Uh, the committee was uh, also working on comparing national benchmarks uh, to the C3 framework. Um, I'm glad to say that I actually served on this task force. I served on the Economics Committee and also the Bias Review Committee, and that's where we're at right now is uh, making sure that all the standards do not have any bias. As far as the next steps, these are tentative dates. And again, keep in mind, this is a, a slideshow coming from the Michigan Department of Education. So hopefully sometime in February or March, uh, after the bias committee completes their work, the standards are going to be updated again, and the Michigan Department of Education will then present the information to the State Board of Education. Uh, and then in March or April, if needed, if uh, the State Board decides to have more listen and learn sessions, uh, these will be added, but we're hoping all the committees that were involved in this process are hoping that this does, <laughs> this does not happen because it is just going to delay uh, the standards even longer. And then hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, uh, by June 2019, those updated standards should be passed by the State Board of Education. In addition to informing our board about the updated uh, social studies standards, I also wanted to spend some time as well talking about the C3 framework, since more and more schools are taking an instructional shift in social studies uh, by incorporating this framework. Uh, the C3 framework was published in 2013 by the National Council for the Social Studies. The purpose of this framework is to shift social studies instruction so that we can better prepare our students to be college, career, and civic life ready. C3 is intended to make social studies more meaningful and rigorous by helping students build their critical thinking, problem solving, and participatory skills, which are all vital to being engaged citizens in society. The C3 framework is implemented using what's called four dimensions. Uh, this inspires curiosity, motivates discussion, and sparks new ideas in our students. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, C3 is also a powerful shift in preparing our students to apply inquiry and make informed decisions about the topics that they're studying. Um, it also helps students make connections to the learning um, as opposed to just memorizing a bunch of facts and dates. Um, I'll also point out that it's, uh, the C3 framework will also greatly benefit our students who do not want to pursue a four-year college degree. So our district talks a lot about getting our kids to be career ready. The C3 framework actually does a really good job doing that. So now this brings us to why I'm up here today and talking about our social studies focus for this year and in future years. So our goal uh, for social studies is to create a vertically aligned curriculum based on the Michigan K-12 social studies standards, helping our students develop the ability to make informed and reasoned decisions for the public good as citizens of a culturally diverse democratic society, and also providing our teachers with the support required to successfully meet the needs of all students. As mentioned last week, our middle and high school social studies teachers have already been given uh, three hours of professional development about the C3 framework. Uh, this was presented by our social studies consultant at Wayne Risa, David Hales, who's a phenomenal presenter, phenomenal colleague to work with as well. Uh, the teachers also had time to collaborate and review those uh, resources that were introduced by David. A lot of them were online resources that are readily available to our, uh, to our staff. The C3 work will resume this year by having our teachers actually uh, align their lessons during their professional learning communities because we found we always talk about collaboration time and we in making that collabor collaboration time meaningful for our staff so I am encouraging our staff to actually look at those lessons and align them align them during their professional learning communities um, I'm also excited to begin working with the teachers at the secondary level to create common assessments that align with C3 um, and the updated social studies standards uh, the intent of this work is actually just to address some of the concerns that were brought up last week in the data that was presented to the board. Uh, these common assessments will also allow our teachers to compare their student data and have deeper conversations about student learning. All of our uh, middle and high school social studies teachers have been trained on SIOP. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with SIOP, it's an acronym for Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. Uh, this is a research-based instructional model that focuses on um, helping meet the needs of our English learners. Um, it's also a culturally responsive method as well. Uh, the model does consist of eight different components, and these components include lesson preparation, building background, comprehensible input, strategies, interaction, practice and application, lesson delivery, and review and assessment. 
Uh, using these instructional strategies, uh, it helps to connect each of these components, and then teachers are able to design and deliver uh, more effective lessons that will reach out to their English learners. Something new that um, I'm going to be implementing this school year is uh, to begin providing professional development to our teachers uh, during their social studies department meetings. Uh, so you think of a lot of times meetings that occur, whether it's a staff meeting or a department meeting, uh, there's usually not a strong focus on professional learning. So my goal is to change that and actually meet with our teachers to provide more professional development. Uh, there was actually a survey that was recently shared with our high school teachers um, to identify their PD needs and interests. Uh, some PD sessions will include the following topics, uh, increasing student engagement in social studies. That's always a topic that always captures our social studies teachers' attention. Uh, culturally responsive teaching, formative assessment, and differentiated instruction. Uh, the survey is also going to be administered to the middle school teachers after I have uh, the opportunity to meet with the middle, middle school social studies department chairs next week. And then the last item on here, uh, to help us dig deeper in our data, uh, the social studies teachers are also going to be given three years of item, item analysis reports. And this is going to help them actually identify specific content expectations where our students did not necessarily demonstrate proficiency. Uh, this year, we will also identify how these content expectations are being taught in the curriculum. And we'll also identify ways that teachers can um, improve their instruction in order to allow our students uh, to be proficient on those content expectations. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the sixth and seventh grade curriculum changes. Uh, currently, right now, our sixth and seventh grade social studies curriculum is being taught in the opposite order of what is included in the state standards. So what this means is sixth grade students are learning world history, which is supposed to be taught in seventh grade, and seventh grade students are learning geography, which is supposed to be taught in sixth grade, but based on those Michigan grade level content expectations. Um, there is a plan to change this uh, during the 2019-2020 school year. Um, there, this will be our transition year where both 6th and 7th grade students will be learning geography so that the following year after that, uh, the district will be aligned with what the state um, recommends as far as the content that's supposed to be taught. So this means that um, geography is taught in 6th grade and world history is taught in 7th grade. Uh, as I mentioned last week, 4th um, and 5th grade teachers will be implementing research units around social studies topics using nonfiction text and narrative text. Students are going to be using graphic organizers and technology to help build their research, reading, and writing skills. Um, I'll be personally observing teachers as we're teaching these units just to make sure that they have the necessary support that's needed in order to accomplish um, the, those writing units or research units, I should say. And then lastly on this slide here, uh, Tanya McCrane, Carrie Fromm, and I um, are going to be providing a variety of resources to our eighth grade teachers to help prepare their students for the PSAT 8-9. Uh, there are practice tests and resources that are already available on various websites. Uh, Khan Academy is one of those websites that actually is um, very resourceful to prepare our students. So it is our goal to give our kids uh, exposure to the assessment so that they be become familiar with it and then also uh, feel confident in taking the test. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Fromm, who you all know very well since she's been up here several times in the last month, and she's going to talk about English language arts. Thank you. So I'm excited to be here with you. As you saw, there's a lot of red lines there. <laughs> and so I want to share with you the really great work that's happening right now. When we look at English language arts, there's really three pillars that kind of guide our work. The first is creating a vertically aligned curriculum that's aligned to the Michigan academic standards. The second is having a balanced approach to literacy that's grounded in research, not what we like to do, but what's best for our students. And the third is providing our, our teachers with the support they need to successfully meet the needs of all students. So what you're gonna notice on each slide is at the top, there's a little research blurb. And so um, the research from the elementary is grounded in the work from the Geln Essential Practices in Early and Elementary Literacy. It's an unfortunate name, Geln, but what it is is it's the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators, MESA, has a subcommittee that is the General Education Leadership Network. And what they were tasked to do is they were tasked to create um, 10 guiding principles of best practice for our students in, the, in literacy. And so these are, were created with the universities, they were created with um, educators in our state, and the State Board of Education. 
They are brown, they are grounded in research, in research, and they are what guide us through the work that we do. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the work that we're doing on our reading units. So as you know, last year we adopted the Mesa units as part of our reading curriculum. Mesa, in conjunction with Oakland Schools, created a curriculum around 10 years ago that they continue to update and work on. It's not just a model curriculum for the state, it's been considered a national model of excellence. So just in case everyone isn't sure of what the workshop model is, a workshop model will take seven to 10 minutes at the beginning of a whole group instruction where students learn skills or strategies. Next, they move into independent reading or writing where the teacher then has the opportunity to move around the classroom and talk with students, um, create meaningful goals, work with small groups. This is where the real differentiation happens. In the middle of that time, they have a quick workshop break where teachers can refocus the class. They can um, talk about what they've noticed. They can give exemplars. They can give strategies to help with what the students are doing. The students go back to reading or writing. And then at the end, there is um, time for partner reading, which can include, at our littlest age, they're reading a book together to book clubs. So they have time then for that productive talk, which we know is crucial in developing comprehension skills. When they're done with that, the teacher wraps up and they give either a, some um, exemplars of what has happened and what has gone well, and they give a hint of what's to come. So kids have an idea of the scope and sequence of the work that they're doing. So um, our work in reading workshop, or in the implementation phase, is going through and looking where did we have gaps last year in the instruction. What, what didn't our students get? Where did we need additional lessons? So we've been building those lessons into the work as well as building informative assessments so that teachers have guideposts and students have guideposts of where they are in meeting those goals. Our work in um, writing is very similar. Right now what we're doing is we are working on filling those gaps from people who have piloted the writing curriculum and we are getting ready for a full district rollout in the 2019-20 um, school year. So the, the next thing that we're working on is really providing um, support to our teachers in the area of small group instruction. Um, one of the th things we know is that small group instruction and one-on-one -on -one instruction is how we move students forward. And when we surveyed our teachers last year, one of the areas that they felt like they needed additional professional development in was in guided reading. We've been really fortunate this year to bring in uh, K2 expert, Shauna Hackstock. Um, she's a state expert who has come and worked with our teachers in small groups of seven to 10. What she's done during that time is she has created a um, clear understanding of what guided reading is. They've built a shared understanding and then they've created lessons. She's actually pulled kiddos out modeled with them, and then the teachers are able to dissect and talk about and see what they saw and ask questions. What's great about this mode of professional development is no matter where the teacher is at, they are able to grow because Shauna is able to um, read the room and people are willing to take risks. Our teachers have been incredibly excited about this work. What we know is one PD for three hours is not enough. So we are very fortunate that our K3 literacy coach has now been working with the principals and those K2 teachers in their buildings every day to continue that support. Shauna will come back in February and March for another half day and will use the feedback that we get from this work to guide her next session. What we know is it takes 50 hours of professional development and conversation to truly change practice. So we continue to work for that. Um, and that ties to why K2, why not 3-5? Because we are really focusing in on the Michigan K3 reading law. Our second graders are the first group that will be affected by this law. So we've developed in K2, we have developed criteria um, for students who need support plans. Those support plans, you hear them called IRIPS. It's not a very uh, fancy acronym, but it's an individualized reading improvement plan. So as a district, 
we have developed a plan that is in line with our current MTSS process. We've provided at-home resources um, for teachers to share. We've provided professional development on how to write and develop these plans. Um, we are supporting teachers in um, discerning what a student's strengths are and what their areas of growth are and how they can write those plans that are meaningful. Right now, our teachers are in the process of finishing up meetings with parents to go over the plans. And then students will be reassessed in January and February. Plans can be discontinued at that point if students have made proficient growth, or they can be modified or intensified at that point in time. Coaching has been offered to all of our teachers around these topics so that they can um, provide the needed support for our students. In terms of word work, when we talk about balanced literacy, word work is a key component. This year, we're working with a, a team of teachers to review and revise our K-5 word study program. And word study includes phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, and spelling instruction. And we'll be ready to roll this out for the 1920 school year. Um, and just so you know, all the pictures up there are kiddos in our own district. So pretty exciting work that's going on. Um, a highlight for us this year has been providing over 80,000 books for classroom libraries. Our teachers have reported increased engagement with our students and their text. We provided literature and text for all levels of readers at, above, and below. Um, and what we pride ourselves on is that our literature allows for windows and mirrors. It allows for students to look into other worlds and see the world from a different perspective, but it also allows them the mirror to see themselves and their life setting inside a um, inside literature. In um, assessment-wise, a big project this fall has been rolling out the benchmark assessment system by Fontes and Pinnell. For those of you who do not know how this works, it's an authentic assessment where teachers sit next to students. They read a text. While they read it, the teacher codes the text to look for um, fluency and decoding issues that might be affecting comprehension. And then they have an authentic conversation with students around the text. They look at within the text, what has happened, summary. They look at beyond the text, making predictions, synthesizing information. And they look at about the text, analyzing and critiquing. Why did the author write it in this format? Through these conversations, teachers um, can determine strengths and see what skills need to develop. It's the type of assessment where we can kind of look in to how their thought process works. This assessment has been key in helping our teachers write meaningful IRIPs, developing flexible groups, and drill down to the skill level so that they and the student can create meaningful goals that they work for, towards. In addition to these assessments, we're working on developing common reading assessments and a K-12 writing rubric. So from K to 12, we have a, a common set of language and expectations. So no matter where a student is performing, they can see where they need to go. So secondary, so lots of fun stuff in, in elementary. Secondary, we still are work, doing lots of work. Their research um, comes from the National Council of Teachers of English and the International Literacy Association. The gown is in the process of finalizing a document for the state that has those 10 instructional practices, but they also have a great PSA or SAT guide that tells about what do students need to be successful on the SAT, what sorts of practices need to be in place. So you have heard um, Pioneer. You've heard me. You've heard lots of people talk about choice reading. So I want to go a little bit more in depth th so that you can understand what's happening. Last year, as a 610 curriculum committee, we recognized the fact that um, choice literacy needed to be a part of outside of elementary school. So we wrote units. We piloted them. And this year, all teachers were given an initial unit on how to involve choice reading in their work. Um, the training began at the beginning of the year. We have um, more training scheduled for throughout the year. 
I just had the opportunity to meet with the high school teachers and we're talking about how do we not have a one-size-fits-all PD? How do we let them sign up for what they need to? You need to work on stamina with students? Great, let's have that PD. So really tailoring it to what the student or the teachers need. Um, they're at different points in the journey and we wanna respect that. Um, we have instructional coaches that will be going in. We're doing a book study on the book, Book Love by Penny Kittle and we are thrilled that Penny Kittle will be coming to our district March 13th. We hope you'll mark your calendar and come and join us because um, she is phenomenal. She's a practitioner and a researcher and the teachers um, really respect the work that she does. And as another note, she is a former resident of Plymouth Canton and she had a student in the Plymouth Canton schools for just a year while her husband was here on a sabbatical. So what is this leading to? We've already seen an increase in our middle school li library circulation over 400%. To put that in perspective, more books were checked out by the end of October than were checked out all of last year. So that is huge in our world. We've also had stu seen students having, um, or seen teachers having students use choice books as the basis of their literary analysis, which dramatically increases the engagement that students have around learning these topics. That picture right up there is a picture out of one of our high schools. I happened to be walking past a classroom and I looked in and every student in that room was engaged in reading a choice book. And so I popped in and I asked if I could chat with them for just a minute. So of course they, they stared at me for a little bit, <laughs> but they, I said, what are you reading? And finally one brave soul raised their hand and they started talking about what they were reading. Next thing I knew, kids were jumping in, they were talking about how they had read it, and then the hands all went up because they all wanted to share. That is a huge step for our high school and what we're offering for our students. Um, Finally, we talk a lot about, about a vertically aligned curriculum. So I just wanted to quickly explain, when we talk about that, we're talking about the understanding by design framework, which means essentially that we take what the outcomes we want students to have and we plan backwards. So we say, we want them to do this, how are we gonna get them there? So our six, 10 teachers worked together last year and what they did is they looked at the standards and how they fit together. They pieced them, and then we as a con had a conversation about how do we put them in a way that makes sense year after year for students. Um, once we had that in place for each unit, the teachers began doing what we call enduring understandings. Enduring understandings are those big picture questions. They're what we want kids to know now, but we, they're questions we want kids to think about 10 years from now. And so example would be reading and writing stories help, our, uh, help us understand ourselves and the world. That's really hard to assess. So then we come up with essential questions that help us then assess how students are doing towards that goal. So an essential question might be, what is the main idea of a story and how is it developed? Those are steps into, into developing that reading and writing and stories help us understand the world. 610 is piloting units that they developed last year. And um, our goal is that we will roll them out to all of the staff for next year. The last thing I wanna talk about is you've heard me talk about embedded professional development and coaching a lot. According to John Hattie and Marzano, having a highly skilled teacher within the classroom is the single highest factor in related to school achievement. Um, when we look at student effect, it is 1.5. Anything over about 6.6 is great. When you hit one, it's amazing. 1.5 is a skilled teacher. So what do our coaches do when they go in to a classroom? They meet a teacher where they are at and move them forward. It's using the growth mindset to move teachers ahead. They involve, they're involved in professional conversations, observations, they may observe the teacher and give feedback, the teacher may observe them and, and, and have a conversation. Instructional rounding, where they might go into a classroom together and see what they see and then talk about how that affects their practice. Modeling, 
where the coach um, shows the teacher how to do something and the teacher tries it. But everything is teacher driven so that we are moving the teachers ahead where they need the work. Currently our curriculum and instruction team has three full-time coaches. There's two of them right up there. Erin Pell, who works with 150 third grade or K3 teachers, and Christy and Deb, Christy Schwartz and Deb Stevens, who work with all of our K-12 teachers. We also have two math teachers at the park who each have one hour of their day to support math coaching. Teachers who have been involved in the coaching cycle have had very positive experience, and we've seen instructional shifts because of the work they are doing. As we move forward and we're collecting data, we want to explore expanding our coaching program. I think board member Sidhu said, what can we do? This is one of the things that when we think about it, what can we do? So we can meet the needs of all of our teachers so they can in turn elevate every student every day. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Brady. Thank you, Carrie. I told you there's exciting things going on inside of curriculum and instruction. It's good, it's good to be on that curriculum instruction team. We're, we're very excited, as you can see, of the things that we have. And you're just hearing two of our contents tonight, the ELA and the social studies. Our work inside of that always is to focus on making sure we're implementing state standards and best practices to the best of our ability so we can elevate every student every day. That's our job inside of teaching and learning and the curriculum instruction team. We'll continue to use the cycle that I shared at the beginning, continue to look at that to make sure we're pacing and we're, and we're making sure that everything that we have to have ready for teachers is there for them so that they can help our students because that's what it's most about. At this time, I would like to answer any questions that you might have. Questions? Member Sidhu? Uh, questions and comments sort of all embedded. First of all, thank you for um, giving us an update about the instructional coaches and instructional rounds. I applaud that work, knowing that how valuable that work is around the county, around the state, nationally. So great work there. My worry is only having three coaches for a district this large, um, but my, um, my hope is that we will expand that work through the research and through the, your findings. And in terms of the coaches that you talked about, I just want to get the number straight. You said one coach for 150 teachers at the elementary level? So that's our coach who's focusing on the K-3 legislation, and okay. so that's why it's 150. That's Erin Pell. And then the other two coaches are K-12 everything. So that's yes, lot. that's the, like 1,100-ish student. How do you get work done? So we have to really focus in, right? So. Um, when we are piloting something, the, the, the two coaches that are um, K-12 everything, we, we're, we're trying to focus them in on what makes the most sense because you can't have everything right. be your master. Right. So for example, we're doing work in middle school science right now, and so Deb is, is focusing there a good amount of time. Christy's doing a lot of work with our K-5 teachers mm -hmm. um, in, in the ELA because that, that's where we're doing a lot of rollout. So we're trying to be very cautious and not overextend because we want to make sure that the work we do when we go into classrooms with teachers is at its highest level. So we're just being very judicious. And then are you going to collect data in terms of student growth based on the, the impact of those coaches? Like, Just kind of wondering, how are you going to measure the impact of that work? So those are conversations actually that my team and I have. We meet regularly and, and talk about that. So one of the things that we're looking at, because we, we are trying to narrow it in a little bit, is we can take it back to te teacher satisfaction, teacher understanding of what they're working on, as well as how students are doing in implementing and understanding that curriculum. Okay. I've got a couple of other questions. Do you want me to wait? or? Go ahead. OK. In, I just need to go back. There were a lot of slides here. In looking at the social studies, the new standards that hopefully will be approved, what's your sense of the alignment with MSTEP? So with I, last week I briefly talked about MSTEP. We are not able to see the questions and how they're asked. Uh, however, they give us what's called the item analysis and we can just see the content expectations. So what I'm hoping to do with that item analysis report that's going to be provided to the teachers is looking at that specific content expectation and see how it's being taught in the curriculum. Um, and then if there is room for improvement as far as what teachers can do better to make sure that students are actually understanding that content expectation. So is the, does the M-STEP need to be tweaked or is it aligned to the new standard? Well, the M-STEP is developed, um, th those 
the questions change every year based on um, they have item writers that actually okay. create those questions. Okay. Yeah. So it, as far as aligning curriculum to MSEP, it's very difficult because right. those questions right. change every year. And also, as I mentioned last week, students are not assessed in the same content expectations every single year. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Member McCoyne. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation. I really like. I'm really excited when you see high school kids reading a choice book because that's so exciting. Um, my question was, um, the year that you flip the social studies so that sixth graders and seventh graders would then both have the geography. Correct. What then happens to that world history piece? Is it just gone? Well, you have to remember year? that they've already those. So the sixth graders already had world right. history. And si the seventh graders already had world history in sixth grade, so that's why for one year they would both have to take geography. So, so that the following year, then we'll have it flip flop so that we are teaching it the correct way. So then will there be like some modifications made for the seventh graders so it's not the exact same curriculum they just went through? Or? They won't go through the same curriculum because if you. No, I mean for the geography. They, so they. Right, they won't have the geography. So the seventh graders will have geography for the first time. Because in sixth grade, they, they had the world history. So that's why we have to do one year where wow. both sixth and seventh graders are both, yeah, they're both being taught geography. Wow, that is <laughs> yeah. amazing. It is. There's a lot of great work coming our way in social studies. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And also the C3, because that's what I use in my classroom, and it really does help students to make connections and to think. Especially, oh, yes, especially in the area of social studies, because you think about social studies, and you think about the way we were taught social studies um, growing up, and it was note-taking, remembering a lot of facts, remembering dates, and it's irrelevant to our students. So with the C3 framework, it definitely helps them make those connections. And I'm also excited about the inquiry piece, because I feel with inquiry, there's so much research done about inquiry, showing us how when there's um, inquiry-based projects or in inquiry-based assignments, it helps the students develop a better understanding of the content. And I really like that you're going to be doing PD with the teachers, like at their buildings, in their staff meetings. I, I figure what's that, the best time to get them, because last week I think um, Member Sid who talked about the, col the collaboration time for teachers and just trying to think out of the box, how can we get our teachers together? Because they're already required to have those uh, department meetings and as opposed to just having them sitting there talking about updates that can be communicated via email, I'd like to come in and actually do some good work with the teachers. Any other questions? So I um, have sort of a maybe political question. <laughs> With the change in administration um, at the state level, do you think there will be any changes as far as um, I know there was a lot of controversy with the social study standards. Um, do you think that maybe they will take that into account and um, maybe take out some of those controversial parts or put back in what was taken out? That was something that the uh, focus groups talked about. Um, as I mentioned, I was part of that work and uh, we said only time will tell. That's really something that we're not going to be able to know until we see what's, what's coming our way. Yeah, and for us, the, all the social studies educators, we just want these standards to be adopted because um, looking at that timeline, you could see that it's, it's been oh, multiple years and so we're just oh, ready to move forward. <laughs> And, I and, and I do remember. our work. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016. 20, 2014. That we, well, that yeah. we had a meeting here at Salem um, that w was public commentary for social studies and also um, the next generation science standards. And so I was present at that. And I, I know it's been a really long time um, coming. So it, it, w it would be nice to, to have it done, but it has to be done right. Correct, I agree with you on that. Okay. Um, same kind of question about the third grade reading law. Do you see that coming up again with the new administration? Or? Again, we, we, we don't know. What we know is that the work that we're doing around the K-3 is the right work for students. So we feel good in the fact that we're developing plans and that kids, we have identified who's struggling and that we're letting parents know and having this common communication. So the practices that are around this law that we are doing, we feel comfortable with. Um, what they'll do with the retention part of the bill, we don't know that yet. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, I think we are now on 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are now on action items discussion. Um, first, I just want to go over our list of outstanding items from the last board meeting. Um, we had this subgroup data, which I think is still outstanding. Um, charter school scores in our district. We, we should have that at uh, next Friday's notes, not tomorrow's. Okay. Next yeah. Friday. <coughs> and then um, scores versus foundation allowance for benchmark districts, including social studies and science. I know we got some information in board notes. Um, Patrick's not here. But <laughs> Dr. Bender, did that include that line from board notes? Uh, not uh, connected with the foundation allowance, but we can work to provide that as well. Okay. okay. Um, and then a sort of a schedule for future presentations. We got a couple tonight. Um, and the cohort data for four years. That, that was we, provided. That was in the board notes, yep. Okay, um, so I wanted to let the board know that um, I received an email from Member Mullen today and um, sh I did send um, you all an email around 5 p.m. Um, I would like Member Mullen to um, talk about what, what sh she included in her email. Thank you so much. Um, the email was a letter of resignation from the school board and um, President Borninsky very graciously guided me through this and accepted my resignation. So I'd like to uh, share with all of you um, my letter um, most sincerely. Dear Mrs. Borninsky, please accept my resignation as a trustee from the Plymouth Canton Community Schools Board of Education effective December 10th, 2018. It was an honor and a true honor to have been elected by the citizens of our district and I'm proud to have served as a trustee. However, at this time, I am not able to devote the time and energy the position requires and that the citizens and students deserve. I'd like to express my gratitude also to our superintendent, Ms. Monica Merritt, and to her, all of her staff, everyone, uh, for their unwavering support and professionalism. Uh, my thanks to my fellow board members it's been an honor to serve with you and to be inspired by your passion for educational excellence. Um, finally, my thanks to Mrs. Borninsky for her guidance and her grace during this journey. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Patty. Um, I would like to express my um, gratitude to you for your you know, uh, service on the board and all, I know it's I know <laughs> it's a very time-consuming job um, I also would like to say that um, I appreciate that you gave us notice now ahead of your um, effective date so that we can work on getting uh, you know candidates together for uh, possible appointment because um, with they're having just been an election. We have two new board members and then a third coming in. It's really important to get everyone trained and or, um, get their orientation done so that we can all serve very effectively together. Thank you. Kay. Anybody else like to have a few comments? I just wanna thank you for your time and service and your passion and your interest in the district and the community. So thank you, because I know you led from your heart. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much for serving. It's been fun. It's been, it was fun running with you. Yes, indeed. Um, but I know that you have a lot to do. I'm getting married next week, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that takes time. Yeah. Oh. And I know that with your job, you have a lot of work to do with that all the time that that really has to come first. So, but thank you for your service. Thank you, Patty. Thank you all. Member Brooks. <coughs> yeah, thanks a lot for your service. We're really gonna miss you. So, good luck where you're in your endeavors. Thanks. Thank you. 
And, and thank you for your service. I know that sometimes there's not enough appreciation expressed for all of the hard work that goes into this position. And we know all of the work that you all do all the time, not just on two Tuesday nights out of the month. Um, and I agree with everything that's been said in terms of your passion, the perspective that you bring as a fellow educator. So although you will not be on the board, you are always a part of our community oh, and we you. still value your, your voice. So thank, thank you. you for the time that you've been thank you. here. Well, I, I tried to fit, I wanted to fit in the, I'm gonna just jump in because that's what I do. Um, oh, okay, I, I, I said the other night after the uh, presentation and I wanna say it, until you're in here, you know, administrators get a bad rap and it is not fair. Um, and I, I, it is not fair. It takes an incredible administration to run an incredible school district. And the foundation that you all, all, even the ones that were here, your whole team, that you all lay for this, people have no idea how, what a gift um, these administrators are. So I commend you. I'm, I'm thrilled to have been a small part of it. But um, yeah, it takes time and passion and energy and mine just needs to be somewhere else for a while. So thank you all so very, very much. Truly an honor. And I'll be Patty Irwin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, with, with that all being said, um, we are going to need another board member, unfortunately. So um, I expect that the district will start uh, advertising for that. Yeah. So as you know, in terms of our process, uh, we would need to have this board appoint um, a new member within 30 days, so last day being December the 10th. Yeah. We need to pay attention to that guideline. It's probably going to mean that we may have to call another meeting before uh, the end of this school year. So we do have a next meeting at December 11th. We will get on the process of advertising, advertising, which is something that we need to do, and that will be in the newspaper, but then schedule an opportunity for um, interviews for any interested uh, candidates that would like to be considered for the position. Mm -hmm. So we would be able to announce then maybe by the December 11th meeting um, when that special meeting would be because the board okay. would need to take action yes. on that. And meeting. I know um, a couple of our board members are going to be absent at the December 11th meeting. So um, we may need to uh, be sure to be checking emails and <laughs> all that so um, everyone knows when we are talking about having our special meeting. I'm just laughing because I'm like, you guys are just not gonna let me get That's right. I'm, I've been counting down in my house. No, no. That's too bad. <laughs> we have to send you off in style. <laughs> I was like, I thought it December 11th was it? I nope. guess not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, and I also hope that everyone at home will pay attention to this process and um, any interested individuals will apply during the window that um, we have the application period for. And also that um, you also pay attention to when our special meeting is in case you want to come and hear any of the potential candidates. So um, now I would like to adjourn and go right into our special meeting on um, uh, the video surveillance policy and the board goals. So um, I would like a motion, please, on adjourning. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Okay. I second it. Okay, motion made by Member Mullen and uh, seconded by Member Brooks. I don't think anyone dis wants to discuss, do they? <laughs> okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 6-0, and we are now adjourned to our special meeting. <laughs>